the next talk, I invite uh, Dr. George to kindly, Dr. George Vergis to kindly come up and introduce Professor Draf. Dr. Uh, good, good morning, every, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to thank each one of you for having come all the way for our course. A great pleasure in introducing Professor Draf. He is one of those persons who have really influenced me a lot because I had the opportunity to be with him for some time. He's a living legend and a great person, not only academically, as a person, he's a very wonderful person. And I should say that it's the hard labor of people like Professor Draf that we are all enjoying today. His research, the hours he has spent on you know, innovative surgical techniques. And as you must be aware, that the first frontal sinus approach was described by Lothrop in 1914. After a gap of 80 years, that is 1991, it was Professor Draft who first came out to us with these endoscopic and microscopic approaches to the frontal sinus. And that has revolutionized the approach to the frontal sinus, one of the most difficult areas in the, in the, uh, among all the sinuses. And we should salute him and persons like him for contributing so much to our speciality. Well, that's, and I don't have to talk about much about Professor Draf. He's a well-known person and a living legend, as I said, a luminary. Now, talking about our workshop, the color of the sky is blue. You must have seen, everywhere it's blue. Our brochure, the background, even the chairs, the ribbons there are blue. It indicates what we want to bring home the message is sky should be our limit as far as surgical skill is concerned and I hope that our course will take you at least near the sky so let's have a great show and I would like to welcome Professor Draf over for his lecture welcome sir well good morning everybody thank you very much George for the very kind introduction I remember a wonderful time we had, my wife and I, we had, uh, I don't need that. Uh, my wife and I had two years ago here in Kerala, and uh, it was a pleasure to have you in Hanover last year. And you came up with the idea to have a workshop just about the frontal sinus. So here we are, and I think it will be a pleasure to discuss the problems of the frontal sinus with my Indian colleagues. So many of them have already a vast experience with this type of surgery. So it's nothing uh, very new, but it's a little bit difficult. So I was asked to give a talk, an overview, how we think about the surgery of the frontal sinus nowadays. And if you look, at this edging from Sukakandal from 1894, you can imagine that the old teachers already realized that um, anatomy is the most important thing. And we just heard a really excellent lecture uh, about the specific anatomy around the frontal sinus. I must say this was one of the best lectures I ever heard about this topic. You see here, since uh, 2006, I'm not working anymore in Fulda because uh, you have to retire at a certain age in Germany strictly and my very famous friend Machi Zami, professor of neurosurgery, created this institute, International Neuroscience Institute in Hanover, and I have the privilege to work there 
as an otorhinolaryngologist uh, consultant, and we frequently operate together, mainly for skull base tumors. If we talk a little bit later about classification of endonasal frontal sinus drainage, uh, we have to ask ourselves, why do we need a classification? Type this and this and this and this, it's confusing. We want to make an opening, a sufficient, we want to create a sufficient drainage of the frontal sinus, and that's it. <coughs> I think a classification is necessary to get an idea about the relationship between underlying pathology and necessary surgical measures. So if we have that, we should do that. Then we have to tell our nurses which instruments we use uh, or we need for this individual operation. But most important is we want to compare results in our own institution and also with other institutions. And if we have not clear definitions what we have done in this specific case, we cannot precisely compare results. So this concept of endonasal frontal sinus drainage, we developed slowly between 1980 and 1984. I waited seven years until we published that because I wanted to be sure it's really something we can recommend. I'm not a fast shooter, but when I shoot, I want to reach my target. And if we talk about this uh, concept, we have to say this is not just a surgical technique. It is a real strategy. Why? Because we want to create a drainage of the frontal sinus coming from below, but we want to preserve the bony borders around the frontal sinus drainage. So when I was a resident, I learned the classic external approaches, and I see several colleagues here, maybe being near to my age, and I'm sure they have learned exactly the same. But if I'm honest to myself, I was always unhappy when I had to perform such a surgery. Why? Because I knew after three years, five years, eight years, ten years, these patients have in 80% a mucosil. Because we remove part of the bone and the danger of shrinking of the frontal sinus outlet we have created is very high. So please keep this in mind. This is the basic difference between the external frontal sinus operation. In Germany, we call it Janssen Ritter because it was developed between 1898 and 1906 in Germany, and then Lynch, 1921, and Howard in England, also 1921, came up with this procedure. So we differentiate type 1 drainage of the frontal sinus uh, as a simple drainage. You can call it also, this is the right side, this is the lamina papyracea. This is the middle turbinate, already trimmed a little bit here. You see the anterior etmoil artery, and you see the untouched frontal sinus opening. It is not always the same, and we just heard that. There are a lot of variations. But just to give you an idea what we understand uh, about a type 1 drainage. So we have to perform at least a complete anterior etmoidectomy to reach this situation you see on this drawing. Most of the time we perform, uh, in, at least in severe bulliposis cases, we perform a complete etmoidectomy. Then we have a type 2 drainage which has to be differentiated into 2A and 2B. This is the 2A drainage. That means we remove the frontal sinus floor between the lamina papyracea and the middle turbinate exactly in this area. So we enlarge the natural opening. This enlargement can be done with a spoon 
or with other small instrument, not with a drill. If we use a drill, we destroy mucosa. I introduced the drill into sinus surgery, and it's necessary in certain cases. But when we can avoid the drill, we should avoid. So this is the type 2A drainage, lamina papyracea and middle turbinate. Sometimes if the pneumatization is not very good, we have the feeling that we have to go until the nasal septum, and then we create a type 2B drainage. Look here. This is a type 2B drainage, and in this case, we usually identify the, anti the first olfactory fiber. So we know in the midline, here at this point, the olfactory fossa is beginning, the anterior fossa is beginning. We can remove in the midline this bone without danger if we see the first olfactory fiber. We will hesitate, we will have problems if we don't identify the first olfactory fiber because then, oh, I could land in the anterior fossa. So it's useful to identify this. Now, sometimes we need extended surgery of the frontal sinus. Don't say radical surgery, because radical implicates the removal of the mucosa. We do not remove the mucosa in most circumstances, except we obliterate the frontal sinus. So we call it extended surgery of the frontal sinus, and there are techniques. You perform extended surgery from below through the nose, or you perform extended surgery using the osteoplastic approach. One thing is clear. You have to have these techniques, the endonasal extended surgery and also the osteoplastic frontal sinus operation, you have to have it in your armamentarium to be able to deal with any case of sinus problem or frontal sinus problem. So the widest and most extended endonasal endoscopic operation of the frontal sinus is the type 3 drainage of the frontal sinus. You see here we remove between the lamina papyracea on one side and the lamina papyracea on the other side the frontal sinus floor in front of the frontal T. The frontal T is a surgically created landmark <coughs> for identification of the first olfactory fibers on both sides. You can compare this with the bridge over the facial nerve if you perform an open mastoid cavity. This is also a surgical created landmark. It's not there. You remove the posterior wall and then you create the bridge. And this is something similar, the frontal T for identification of the first olfactory fibers. Very important is that you remove also the septum sinuum frontalium. There is one, sometimes there are two, sometimes there are three. So you have to remove these septa as much as you can. And with the new curved drills, you can achieve a lot. And another important point is that you have to resect part of the nasal septum which is in contact with the frontal sinus floor. And this diameter here should be at least 1.5 centimeters. In the beginning I was not so aggressive and we had some recurrences, closure, scarring, but if you really open this and you remove the septa, 
then the chance that this uh, drainage remains open is very high. Here you see also a frontal cell, a type 4 frontal cell according to Fred Kuhn. So this cell needs to be removed whenever possible. Uh, somebody, uh, Charlie Gross, called this procedure some years later modified Lotrop procedure uh, and published a paper in 1995. Well, you can discuss if this uh, name is really uh, correct because if you look at the original drawings of Lotrop, Lotrop warned to go through the nose to open the frontal sinus. Lotrop created a median drainage, and this is his achievement, there is no doubt, resecting some bone of the frontal sinus outlet and the lateral border of the ethmoid. It said two centimeters, but to create this opening, I'm not sure if this small opening from outside is sufficient. So this is what Lotrop uh, described, but he never went through the nose for this opening. There was in Germany one other, uh, Halle in Berlin. He used already very early a drill, as you can see, removed the frontal beak through the nose, just having headlight and naked eye. This is amazing. He must have been an extremely good surgeon and created a frontal sinus drainage into the nose. Interesting enough, he did obviously not remove the frontal, uh, the ethmoidal cells, but maybe he just wanted to demonstrate how you can open the frontal sinus like this with a drill. So in the midline, he already recognized you need a drill. You cannot manage with spoons or whatever. So this is Halle. Many people tried to do this procedure at that time and they failed. They went into the anterior fossa. They created meningitis, brain abscess, people died, many people died. And from that moment, at least in our country, endonasal surgery of the sinuses was dead until the 70s. When I was a resident, and I would have operated the ethmoid through the nose, my boss would have killed me next day out of the department. Absolutely not allowed. You have to realize that to see how everything changed with new technical tools. We also have a, some sort of modified type 3 drainage in cases like this. You see here, this is a mucosil, a pyosil of the frontal sinus on one side. Ethmoidectomy uh, was done on this side, but the patient suffered again an obstruction. He had two operations before. So in this case, it is okay to perform a type 3 drainage to remove the frontal sinus floor between lamina papyracea on one side and the other side, but to leave the ethmoid, which is free of disease, untouched on the healthy side. But you remove this and you remove this. So this is what we call modified type 3 drainage. That means on one side we leave an undeceased ethmoid untouched. What makes the performance of a type 3 drainage, everybody tells me it's so difficult, we cannot learn it, we cannot learn it. You can learn it. You have to attend anatomical courses. You have to read books. And if you look here, this is a book uh, we published together with uh, some American friends, Stilianos Kuntakis and Brent Senior. Uh, you find everything about the frontal sinus. And this is a very new book, 2009. Uh, the initiator was an Indian, Chris de Sousa from Mumbai, and we worked together, and you find here also all the endoscopic uh, 
uh, work for the sinuses. And finally, we also have created a DVD you can get free of charge from the Storz company with all the movies, how to perform a type 3 drainage and everything. I think we cannot do more. But if you take these things and you put it under the pillow and you wait for spontaneous diffusion, this is not enough. You have to work on it. Sorry about that. <laughs> so the other thing which makes it easier is you have a very detailed information about the frontal sinus anatomy. If you of your patient, if you read very carefully the images, CT and, if necessary, magnetic resonance imaging. So you know the individual anatomy. You have to observe life surgery and all these things you are doing during this course. And I hope we can demonstrate you something informative. And you can also see the problems the surgeon has, even experienced surgeons have. And I'm sure we will have problems during the surgery. So one thing I would strongly recommend, if you can, try to learn to be B manual. That means you should be able to have the endoscope in one hand, in the right hand, or the left hand, not only in the right hand, or not only in the left hand. You should be versatile. And you should be able to use every instrument with the right or the left hand, because sometimes the angle for the left frontal sinus is better if you have a drill in your left hand, and for the right frontal sinus it's better you have the drill in your right hand. So it's not easy, but you can learn it. If you train it from the very beginning, anatomical dissection course, try it, because then you can become really good. We need a zero degree telescope and most of the work we do with the zero degree and for specific things in the frontal sinus or in the maxillary sinus or in the sphenoid sinus, we work with a 45 degree telescope. Keep in mind, I was a promoter of combination of microscope and endoscope in the earlier times when we did not have these wonderful new drills. Nowadays, I operate exclusively with the endoscope. But still, you can perform a good operation combining, if you feel better, combining microscope and endoscope. But you cannot do a good operation with a microscope alone. This is not acceptable anymore. So for tumor surgery, we uh, use always navigation and one thing which is also recommendable is the forehand technique so if you work together uh, somebody if it's bleeding very much somebody can hold the endoscope and you can operate having a suction and an instrument so this is a forehand technique which is now recommended by many different surgeons but it was published the first time and used the first time by Mark May in the United States in Pittsburgh. I saw him operating already in 1990 with this forehand technique. So the new drills are really helpful. They, uh, you have different curves. You, can comp you have the same handpiece for shaving and for drilling. And you have to go step by step, very clear surgical uh, technique and rely on landmarks. Uh, maybe today we operate a lady which has, she has no middle turbinates anymore. So you need other landmarks. One landmark is the lacrimal uh, bone, lacrimal sac. Sometimes I identify the lacrimal sac to be sure where we are. This is always there. <coughs> Most of the time you find the lamina papyracea. This is also usually there. So these are really good landmarks. The koana for the sphenoid sinus opening is a very good landmark and also the anterior skull base. And finally, the first olfactory fibers. <coughs>
it is very important to do this work very delicately, not just open in front of the eye, ha, ah, I have opened it. No, you have to do everything 100% precisely, like a tympanoplasty. And then you are in a long term successful. So nasal septum resection, septum sinum frontalium resection, very, very important points. Indications for type 1 drainage, if we can uh, not treat an acute sinusitis um, through the conservative therapy, sometimes we need surgery if there are orbital or endocranial complications. Uh, we operate a chronic sinusitis if it's first time surgery using a type 1 drainage. If the patient has no prognostic risk factors, what do I mean with prognostic risk factors? These are patients with polypose, aspirin intolerance and asthma. These patients have a poor prognosis. They have an even poorer prognosis if they are smokers. So you have to tell the patient, if you continue smoking, the likelihood to have a recurrent polyposis is 50%. So then it's the fault of the patient and not the fault of the surgeon. You have to tell them, because otherwise they are blaming you. And uh, we also perform a type 1 drainage if we have to perform a revision surgery and there was no complete etmoidectomy. The degree of frontal sinus opacification is not so important uh, for our decision. So I give you one example which I really like very much. This is a lady came in at 10 o'clock in the evening with this very clear history everything examination and uh, uh, CT showed a subperiostal abscess and a purulent etmoiditis and frontal sinusitis. So external operation, endonasal operation, this is a fantastic indication for an uh, endonasal endoscopic operation. So we did and we performed the type 1 drainage of the frontal sinus and you see here that this patient was two days later like that without any incision from outside. Or this case, 15 months before operation because of polyposis. And the patient came back with a recurrent polyposis and if you look at the axial CT, there are still a lot of cells next to the skull base. So there is no need to do immediately a type 3 drainage or type uh, 2A drainage. Uh, in many cases, a type 1 drainage is okay if the patient doesn't have the risk factors, as I mentioned. So it can look afterwards like this, no polyposis anymore and uh, a nicely lined situation in the etmoidal cell system. Type 2 drainage is indicated if we have serious complications of acute sinusitis. It's a little bit soft, this indication. It's not so clear, but uh, something is sometimes not uh, so uh, clear to define. Medially located mucosili is fine, for some type of tumor surgery, in particular osteomas, we will talk about that tomorrow. It's also a good indication. In general, if we have a good pneumatization, good quality mucosa, we can perform a type 2A drainage and rarely a type 2B drainage. 2A drainage is exactly the same what my friend Heinz Stamberger calls uncapping the egg. If there is a frontal cell and he removes this frontal cell out of the frontal sinus outlet, this is a type 2A drainage. You see here an infundibulum osteoma uh, 
because the pneumatization was not so good, we performed a type 2 drainage of the frontal sinus. So these are situations after a type 2A drainage, and the differentiation is important because 2A, we don't need a drill, 2B, we need a drill. This is uh, important, and you see here very nicely the skull base, the posterior ethmoidal artery, anterior ethmoidal artery, and you see also here a very nicely normal frontal sinus opening. Indications for type 3 drainage are here. I think this is very clear, and we are going to show you one case uh, during this course because uh, George and I, we decided it's better to show a lower number of cases, but in detail, rather than a lot of cases, and you don't see very clearly, it's fast, fast, fast. It's not my way of teaching, at least. We discussed this really very long. So look here, this is a young dentist. He had two pan sinus operations, and he suffered headache. If you knocked against his anterior wall of the frontal sinus, he had pain. If you pressed the thumb against the floor of the frontal sinus, he had pain. So these two things are most important, the best and surest clinical signs of a pyocele. If you have these symptoms, you can be almost 100% sure there is a frontal sinusitis, pyocele, or a purulent frontal sinusitis. Keep that in mind. And then you, you order for a CT. Very important. So this patient had this, and these are the CTs. And you see here um, the uh, most superior anterior uh, cells, uh, ethmoidal cells, still left on both sides. <coughs> you see here, this is a complete closure of the frontal sinus by scars. The same is on the other side. And at this time, we started still with the microscope. So uh, because this patient had a relatively good ethmoidectomy, we used the mid, middle approach. So we started at the nasal septum and not via the ethmoid as we usually do. And then we can drill and uh, I'm going to go to the endoscopic part. So here, this is still microscopic part. You see here the frontal sinus floor was extremely thick, extremely thick. Uh, almost three millimeters. So you have to use a drill. Now, slowly, after having identified the first olfactory fiber here, we are opening the frontal sinus and pus is coming out. <coughs> At this point, uh, we want to see the first olfactory fiber and then we go to the endoscope and create, this is a 45 degree telescope, you see here the first olfactory fiber on the right side here, you see the opening, and very soon you see also here on the other side the first olfactory fiber. So, all this bone around this needs to be removed with the suction irrigation drill, with the shaver drill. In my hands, this works very well, and we are stepwise opening the frontal sinus more and more. And now we are removing a little bit more of the septum nasale, first olfactory fiber, left olfactory fiber, this is the frontal T. Okay, we mark it with some ink to make it clear. Olfactory fiber. So if you have that, you are not nervous. You really go to the most posterior uh, 
part of the frontal sinus floor. And then we drill at the other side. And we find also the pyrocele on the left side. But this is not enough. You have to remove the floor of the frontal sinus completely. Now the work starts and you have to remove the interfrontal sinus septum or the septum sinum frontalium. You see this here. And for that, if we have removed nasal septum, we can work by mirtel. That means we can put the endoscope through one opening of the nose and the instrument through the other opening. So we have much more space. You see the drill is coming from the left side, the endoscope was in the right side, and vice versa. Left frontal sinus, septum sinum frontalium. And we still have here some bone between the right etmoid and the frontal sinus. This needs to be removed. So we have to have a chimney between the etmoid and the frontal sinus on both sides. This is not easy, but it is very important to have a good final result. We are very careful with cutting drills. You saw here a uh, cutting drill. We are very careful with that, but sometimes we use it. And you see here, we still remove with the drill more of the interfrontal sinus septum. And also on the left side, we want to create a good chimney between the etmoid and the frontal sinus. This is of utmost importance. And now you see we have a wonderful large opening. And the trick is to put rubber finger stalls into the frontal sinus for one week, we leave it inside. Rubber finger stalls with a sponge inside, fixed on the nasal dorsum. We leave it for one week. We tell the patient beforehand. You can also use the scale of uh, Stamberger. It's, it's nice, but it's too expensive. This is the problem. And we want to see one year after surgery something like this. It doesn't happen in all the cases, but at least in 80% of the type 3 drainage, we achieve a result like this. <coughs> so what are the advantages and disadvantages of the endonasal and the external approach? I mentioned this already. You can read it yourself. So we can sum up that the likelihood of closure of the frontal sinus with the external procedures is much higher than with the endonasal procedures due to uh, preservation of the bony borders of the frontal sinus outlet. I should mention one new technique which is now propagated on the market and this is the balloon sinoplasty. It's a good idea and I think it's a, a good technique for barotrauma, for example. But again, it is also expensive. And I cannot understand why we need a hybrid procedure. That means combination of etmoidectomy and to use the balloon for the frontal sinus, which is $1,200 overall. So it's a matter of taste, a matter of money. If the patient pays it, it's fine. It's basically a good technique. In, in Germany, there is now a study on the way, a prospective, clear study of five departments, and we really want to find out what is good and what is not good. The company is a little bit aggressive on the market. I told them, don't do that in Germany. It doesn't work. I, in fact, you reach the contrary, and they are now a little bit more careful. So I have nothing against the balloon. I think it's useful for certain procedures in kids, for example, acute sinusitis, you need something done. 
some drainage of the frontal sinus, but we still have to wait what are the indications for this technique. And this is what I wanted to mention to you. This is Dr. Wang from uh, the United States, and he gave uh, once a very good lecture and asked all these questions. And these questions are still open, they are not answered. Sometimes the people come and say, now 1,500 procedures have been performed. Yeah, okay, what is 1,000 procedures? It's very important to know clearly what have been the indications and for what is it really useful an advantage to that what we have. I, I'm sure it will find its place, but for me it's still not clear what the place is. Not everything can be managed endonasally, and sometimes we need something in addition or something else. And this is the obliterative osteoblastic frontal sinus operation. In chronic sinusitis, mostly obliterative, but you can perform it also without obliteration. And this technique was published already by Tato and Bergaglio from Argentina. So it should not be forgotten because they have not published very much, but they have been the first one publishing it. And often we have to complete an etmoidectomy through the nose because there is no surgery better than the endonasal technique to open all the etmoid, to really resect all the septa. And we have to combine this with an obliterative frontal sinus obliteration. These are the indications. If we are not successful with an endonasal procedure and it's not possible because the AP diameter is less than, now I say, 0 0.8 centimeters. Uh, if it's less than that, it's a problem to perform a good type 3 drainage then we have to decide for an osteoplastic procedure. Huge osteomas, we need the osteoplastic procedure. We are talking about it tomorrow. And sometimes it's very useful for an aesthetic correction of a sinus dilatans. If we use this osteoplastic technique, we perform a coronal incision without shaving hairs because the patient doesn't like to have a surgical stigma for the next half year until the hairs have grown again. It's not necessary to shave hairs. From the sterility point of view, it's okay. It's only the laziness of the surgeon who doesn't want to accept the additional difficulties to suture and so if there are still hairs. So this is one point. The other point is you have to remove the frontal sinus mucosa and the polyps very meticulously using microscope and endoscope. It's not enough just to strip off the mucosa. You have a recurrence, you have recurrent mucosils in 30% if you do so. You have to drill in dangerous areas like the orbital roof or the posterior wall of the frontal sinus, use a diamond. In the other areas, use a cutting drill. Why? because you preserve the vascular channels for revascularization of the fat you put in. <coughs> you see this here, and it is also very important, I just mentioned the most important things now, you have to read the details and you see it. You see here, you have to close the frontal sinus against the nose in three layers. We use cartilage and perichondrium, cartilage from the ear and perichondrium, and sometimes, in addition, some gallia periosteum. And then we put cubes of fat into the frontal sinus. Just a short movie about this, uh, a short video clip. You see here, the hairs are left. This is a patient with a mucosil. We identify the superior vascular nerve bundle, supraorbital, supratrochlear. Then we use a template and about one, 1 1.5 centimeters out of the template, we incise the periosteum, mobilize it a little bit, leave the periosteum on the bone, 
and then we use this orthopedic saw, oscillating saw, and just fracture. We don't go to the floor of the uh, frontal sinus. So we fracture, and then we remove the mucosa completely. This was a pyocele, by the way, uh, situation after. This is the um, roof of the orbit and the periorbit already. So here, diamond drill. With the diamond drill, a large diamond drill, you can remove very nicely the mucosa from the dura. So if the dura is free, this is not a contraindication against this obliteration. You can remove, and we proved that with biopsies, you can remove with a large diamond drill very nicely the mucosa from the dura. So we take fat from the abdomen, either via a scar of appendectomy or around the navel, and then we take cartilage from the ear and close the frontal sinus. I, I don't understand very frequently ENT surgeons are nervous to perform this procedure. You can learn this procedure. You have to teach it in courses. Uh, it's not so difficult, but you must be able to close a dural defect. This is clear. And then we put the fat into the frontal sinus. Uh, frequently, just putting back the bone, knocking a little bit with a hammer is fine. Sometimes we need a mini plate to fix it. Sometimes just the suturing of the gallia periosteum is fine, keeps everything in place. Then we need a drainage. And the patient goes after a few days home and has no surgical stigma. This is very important. You see here, this is a patient with a chronic sinusitis and a pneumo sinus dilatans. So we use the technique I have published in 86, <coughs> uh, similar to septoplasty, you just have the bone hanging on the gallia periosteum and you remove some stripes of bone horizontally, okay? And then you can push back the frontal sinus and you can correct relatively easily the uh, bulging of the pneumosinus dilatans. This is another patient, unfortunately from the other patient, I don't have photos, but this is another patient. We have done this technique. He had a severe bulging, and you see it's not, the result is not too bad. And if we have a scalp, uh, a, a, a patient with, um, uh, a bare scalp. We go with our incision like this in the corona behind. So you have a huge scalping flap, but the patient has no scar. And you see this here very clearly. So we come to the end. Most of the problems of the frontal sinus can be solved with an endonasal procedure. If not, we should be able to perform an osteoplastic procedure. If we have osteomas and a good mucosa, there is no need for an obliteration. But in most of the cases of chronic frontal sinusitis, we need an obliteration. And one thing I want to state clearly, the classic external frontal sinus operation is obsolete for treatment of chronic frontal sinusitis. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm exactly in time. If there are questions, I can answer. If George agrees, where is he? No question, everything is clear. So go to the microphone or come here. You have a microphone for discussion? Morning, sir. Uh, is there a role of bone cement in obliteration? Instead of using fat, we can use the bone cement. It, uh, it's an exothermic reaction, so it kills all the mucosa.
and the same way it, uh, exactly it promotes osteogenesis so you can uh, as well close it. Is there a role, sir? Thank you for the question because you allow me to become aggressive. <laughs> Don't use bone cement. If the bone cement is in contact with mucosa, okay, in this case you remove the mucosa. I have seen terrible cases where a mucosil was growing behind the bone cement and the patient had serious endocranial complications. I am now a little bit older than you. In my younger years, I used all the different types of bone sores, uh, glass ionomer cement, so I really have experience with that. But believe me, as soon as it is in contact with the sinuses, in one or the other way, after two years, five years, ten years, everything is coming out. Uh, you can use palacos, for example, for reconstruction away from the sinuses. I use it. My neurosurgical colleagues use it. That's fine. But never near to the sinuses. I can show you complications. I have it in this computer. Uh, when a patient after trauma reconstruction of the forehead with palacos had Complications, complications, pyocele again and again. And it did not work until the last little piece of 0 0.5 centimeters to 1 centimeter was out. It's amazing. So my recommendation is if you have a pure lens sinusitis, you have a defect of the forehead, use the patient's bone. You have a fantastic bone shop here. If you use a coronal incision, you have a great bone shop here. So you can use this. And it works even in purulent cases. So we went away from delayed reconstruction. We operate, we remove the inflammatory disease, and we reconstruct immediately. If it's bone of the patient, or even bunk bone, hip, uh, femur, head, uh, from the bank. I, I got it from my orthopedic surgeons. Now with the AIDS and so it's more difficult to have that. Even that, it works. But artificial material does not work. Okay? I hope I did not offend you, but this is the truth. Excuse me, Professor. Sir. Hello. Sir, please tell us about identification of the first olfactory fiber? There are uh, two ways about the identification of the olfactory fibers. You can incise the origin of the middle turbinate one centimeter with a scissor, the best, and then push the middle turbinate downwards and about 1.5 centimeters behind the head of the middle turbinate, just medial to the middle turbinate, you can find the first olfactory fiber. This is not an imagination. You find at least the hole where it is coming out. This is one technique. The other technique, which was developed later by my friend Paolo Castelnovo, is also an elegant technique but it works better in the anatomical dissection course than in nature. If you incise the mucosa at the level of the head of the middle turbinate in the wall of the nose, so in the nasal cavity, medial to the middle turbinate, you incise the mucosa from the nasal septum to the other side to the middle turbinate. And then you take a plated knife, as you use it for ear surgery, and you go backwards. You can also find the olfactory fiber. I try to show it uh, during the surgical demonstration, and I hope I, I will be successful. Yeah. Uh, can, can we... Uh, thank you, sir. Actually, we're running short of time, so can we just go on to the sir, next uh, session? Sir, you said uh, in osteoplastic surgery, we should use the cutting bar. 
to I mean to encourage circulation to the fat. But you use the diamond burr, diamond drill to take out the mucosa. I use the diamond burr for removal of the mucosa at the orbital roof if the peri orbit is free, uh, or in general for the orbital roof because the bone is thin. And always use a large diamond burr. It's much better than a small one because with the small one, you slip in and you may hurt this little branch who is responsible for the levator palpebrae muscle, opening the eye. I had it once, thanks God, only temporarily, so I injured somehow a little bit, a little bit, this nerve, but it's a disaster. If the patient cannot open the eye after surgery, he's not very happy. And if this is not resolving spontaneously, it's going to be a court case. So in, here I use it and for the dura. If you have a very large frontal sinus and you have to go far backwards, I remove the whole posterior wall, retract the dura, and then I can drill until the minor wing of the sphenoid. You have space enough. But it takes time. We had a wonderful case but, uh, for this uh, meeting, but it takes six hours, so it exceeds the time we, which is available. Thank you, sir. So that is a masterpiece description of all aspects of frontal sinus surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you.